This podcast contains uh, some content and language that might be upsetting for sensitive listeners or young children, and uh, but we do hope you listen because it's pretty awesome. And it comes to you from the duo of Annie McEwen and Matt Kielty. Oh, wait, you're listening. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. <coughs> you're listening, listening to Radio Lab. Radio Lab. From WNYC. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so how should I start this thingy? I don't know. Um, I mean, okay, whatever. I, oh, probably a. Uh huh. I think this all came out of a question that I had. Oh sure. Um, how does a baby take its first breath? Uh, how does a baby like a fetus is spending all this time inside the womb, right? Right. And that that is like a water world. But then it comes out of the mom, and then all of a sudden it can breathe in this air world. That's a crazy transition. Yeah, it's weird. I guess I would assume the transition is essentially like water world breathing, water world breathing, born. It's now just breathing differently. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, well, do you find that at all? Are you at all curious or interested in finding out how it actually works? No, I think I got it. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you because the true answer is... Totally bananas, and I just could, I, I, I can't, I, anyway, I'll just tell you it. Tell me. Okay, so first, just to set it up, let's just review really quickly how you and I are breathing right now. Okay. So, as you might remember from elementary school, this whole thing is like a little do do between the lungs and the heart. Mm-hmm. Okay, so blue, blood, blood low in oxygen enters the right side of our heart. From there, it gets pushed to the lungs, which are filling with air... Oxygen hops on the blood, CO2 hops off, boop, boop. Okay, okay, okay. Returning to the heart, the blood is bright red in color because it is filled with oxygen. Cool. It's going to enter the left side of the heart this time, not the right. It's going to go the other side of the heart. And then from there, the red blood gets fired out around the body. It's going to go to the brain, our legs, our arms, our organs, which is like got to deliver its little oxygen parcels to all our cells. All our cells? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and one more thing... <laughs> <laughs> One thing to pay attention. So um, we have in our hearts, so we have these two different sides to it, the right and the left. Yeah. Between those two sides is a wall. And the red and the blue blood just doesn't mix. Like one side of the heart has the stuff that needs oxygen. The other side of the heart has the stuff that has oxygen. Right. Okay. Now we're going to learn how a fetus in a womb breathes. It's very different. Right. I mean, the baby is surrounded by water pediatric infectious disease doctor Rishi Desai. And its lungs are full of water. Oh. So you're not going to get any oxygen from them. But that's okay because instead, of course, for a fetus, the oxygen comes from... Mom. The mother. Right. She does the process you just laid out. Yep. And then... This wonderful oxygenated blood that's bright red. Gets sent down to the placenta. The placenta grabs the oxygen and puts it into the fetus blood. Okay, so things get a little weird here. Absolutely. Red blood leaves the placenta through the umbilical cord. Goes in the belly button. And then through a small special tube, baby tube, that you and I no longer have. Weird. It gets shunted into a giant vein that zooms it up to the heart. It goes into the right atrium, which is where blood normally goes. Now, if it was you and me, this would then go to the lungs, but it doesn't go to the lungs because the lungs are just pretty much useless. The lungs are full of water, right? They're just hanging there like these soggy raisins. That sounds disgusting. So instead of going to the lungs, that blood goes through... Trap door. Oh. There's a door. In the heart. In the heart? There's a door in the wall of the heart. Between the two atriums, left and right. And you and me, the two atria are completely separate, walled off. But in the baby, there is a special little door. Okay. It has a special little flap that opens one way. That little trap door is flopped open. So the blood all mixes together and you've got this combination of fresh, you know, oxygenated blood from the placenta and old blood from the rest of the baby's body. Purplish, maroonish blood, right? Which then gets pumped out to the rest of the baby body, goes to the brain, goes to the legs, goes and nurtures its cells and blah, 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 blah. Eventually it gets back into the placenta where the carbon dioxide hops off. And then mom will carry that in her blood to her own right atrium and then to her own lungs and then breathe that out. Wow. Got it? Got it. Got it. Okay. So this system with the special baby tube and the trapdoor heart and the mixing blood and all of that 
at the moment the baby is born has to somehow transform into the system that you and I have. Within seconds. Whoa. Okay, so let's go to, or do you have any questions or can we go to labor? No, 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 yeah, it all makes sense. Labor, 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 okay. Um, but, 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 labor begins. As mom's squeezing and as the baby's coming through the birth canal, it's a little bit like wringing a towel dry. All that squeezing and squishing is pushing this water out of the baby's lungs and... Into the baby's body. Wait, what? Like, we just kind of, like, absorb the water. Like, our Wait, bodies are like, yep. In- internally? Yes. Weird. Okay, so labor, labor, labor. Squish, 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 squish. And then... The baby comes out of the mother. The moment a baby is born, it's extremely wet. And for the first time in its life, it's cold. It's never been cold before. Oh. Actually, if babies aren't, like, dried and swaddled... The baby can lose a lot of heat right away and can die from hypothermia very quickly. Oh, my God. I never thought of the shock that is. Yeah. But it's also useful. When that cold hits... The skin sends little signals to the baby's breathing center in the nervous system. And this breathing center is just like waking up. It's like someone's rapping loudly on its bedroom door like, Wake up! Wake up! It's time! And it's like groggy and like, wait, what do I... Okay, as that's (laughs) happening, um, the umbilical cord that has been supplying this baby, it's oxygen, it's nutrients, it's everything is... Getting super tight. This thing already is beginning to close. That's insane. So there's no blood coming in through that umbilical vein. That means there's no oxygen getting to the baby, but it also means that that CO2 in the body is beginning to build. The baby is suffocating. Well, a baby comes out and it looks blue, right? Oh. It's blue because it's not breathing yet. Huh. It's, it's like it's never breathed in its life. But this baby taking a breath... It has to happen, and it has to happen fast. Meanwhile, the carbon dioxide levels are rising. Until finally, that little breathing center woken up by that cold skin snaps into action. And all of a sudden, the brain triggers. (laughs) The baby takes in a big breath. And with that breath... The nervous system's like, (gasps) go! As the oxygen hits the lungs... All the dominoes start falling. All the muscles keeping blood out of the heart. In unison, relax. Blood is just rushing into these lungs, picking up all this fresh oxygen. The lungs are opening up like two sails filling with wind. The blood then rushes from the lungs back to the heart and as it enters the left side, that door that's been pushed open the whole time, boom, slams shut. The wall is sealed. The heart is divided. Now you've got no mixing anymore. That door will never open again. And that special baby tube I mentioned starts to close. Protein is kind of like sewing it shut. (laughs) <laughs> wow. <laughs> the baby is now breathing on its own. <laughs> it's funny because it's like it is a little story of the necessity of trauma. that like the deeply traumatic act of coming into existence in the air breathing land world the like severity of it and the harshness of it forces you to adapt right in order to survive right of course that's just the first breath then there's another and another, and another, and another, and another, and another. All right. I'm Andy McEwen. I'm Matt Kilty. This is Radiolab. And today we are going to do a show all about breath. And another. About how after that first breath, 
and the next, and the next breath. From the moment you are born to the moment you find yourself in right now, these breaths can be long, they can be shallow, they can be short, they can be quick, they can be harsh, they can be quiet, they can be soft. But like whatever they are, they set some sort of like rhythm in our lives. Which makes you kind of wonder, like, where do those rhythms come from? And we just figured this sounds totally like a question for... Molly Webster. Our senior correspondent. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> Is that good? Yeah. All right. So I ended up talking to this guy. Mark Krasner, professor of biochemistry at Stanford University. Okay, perfect. So Mark is a lung researcher. My favorite topic. It's my favorite topic, obviously. (laughs) And we're going to pick up with him in like the early aughts. Kind of a natural extension. So he actually has this question of just like, well, what is actually controlling the rhythm of the lungs? Exactly. Like what makes you breathe? Exactly. Yeah. So he starts doing some research and he finds this paper that says if you go down to the base of your brain. In what's called the brainstem. It's kind of the space that goes up between that like, oh, like groove that, that you have at the back of your oh, skull. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's right buried deep below that. I can feel it right now. And it is right there that Mark learned that there is this little clump of neurons. That are actually initiating... Each breath. With every single pulse, they send a signal down the spinal cord. Your diaphragm and the tiny muscles between your ribs. Telling them to expand. And then they send another signal telling them to contract. And this is just what these neurons do. They are the pacemaker neuron. Huh. Hmm. So there are 86 billion neurons in your brain, and it is just this clump of maybe 8,000 that do this very vital thing. That seems very small. It does seem very small, does it not? Yes. <laughs> and so, with, with so Mark came across this paper, actually by this guy named Jack. I, I consider Jack the father of the of the field. Just a just a really quick Jack Feldman shout out. <laughs> Wonderful. But oh, right, right. when Mark came across Jack's research, we found out he just had this really simple question, which was, "Hey." Are, are all these neurons, are they all the same as one another, or um, are they different from one another? And so we started interrogating these neurons. And so he and some colleagues, what they did was they started looking at this group of neurons in a mouse brain under a microscope. And what it seemed to be a uniform mass of beating. It turned out these neurons weren't all alike. There are over 50 different types really? of the pacemaker neuron. Huh. Mark was just like, okay, weird. You know, what, why are they different and what do they do that's special? So to start, in mice, Mark decides to focus on the specific group. These 200 neurons from the breathing pacemaker. And basically, with some molecules and a syringe. We can very precisely remove just those neurons. And so Mark's team goes in. They shut down the 200 neurons. Mouse is happy. Mouse is alive. And basically what happens is mouse stops sighing. What? Which was like, whoa. So I didn't know this, but mice sigh. That's so and that's And so that's just like saying like, oh, these 200 neurons control sigh. And, and, And they are the only neurons apparently in the brain that have this specific function. Weird. Yes. And that's not all. In another experiment, they knocked out, uh, again, like 150 neurons and the rate of exhalation changes. So like, you know how you can go like, and then you go, and you can say, I want to exhale for four seconds, Mm -hmm. or your body just does it naturally at some rhythm. Um, They found that when they took out this one group of neurons, the rate of exhalation got got much longer. Huh. Huh. And so they're like, oh, interesting. So so they're starting to put together this little, like, visual map of, like, what all these different neurons do. Mm-hmm. They all must have a function, right? Yeah. So, so this um, is- And so they, you know, go to another group of neurons. You know, roughly 150 neurons. Knock them out. But this time... Very, very disappointing. Nothing happens. So, like, that's weird. Like, did really nothing change, you know? And they realize a few days later that something did change. That, hey... 
these mice look chillaxed. <laughs> they are very calm. They're just kind of licking their fur and hanging out in place. Chill. Mellow. It's like, what are what are <laughs> oh these God, neurons? Give me those. <laughs> and they start looking at what the neurons are connected to. You know how neurons can have those long, like, tentacle projections? Mm-hmm. And those let them communicate with other neurons? Uh-huh. And he realizes that where they actually go is directly to the fight or flight center of the brain. And so the story that they've put together is that this group of neurons, what it's probably doing is sending updates about the status of the breath pacemaker to the fight or flight region, saying like, we're working, everything's okay over here. And they're like sending these little signals, giving it updates. And if something's wrong... They can send a thing straight to fight or flight and be like, mayday, mayday, breath is breath is a mess. Mm. Like, breath mm. is a mess. We I need see. to fix it. Huh. I guess I think of it, would it be the other way of, like, you see something really scary, fight or flight, then sends, sends a signal to the, breathe, the breath pacemaker being, like, pick up the pace well so the so 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 this starts where this is where you can really start tripping off on some cool gnarly things about breath <laughs> that's what i want to do <laughs> let's do it that's what i'm here for <laughs> okay let's do it great so mark walk me through this very cool thing so th- there are two great pacemakers in our body one that many people know about is the pacemaker of the heart which you know beats every second and it's um, it's located right in the organ that it controls. It's right. It's right there in the heart. So there's actually like pacemaker cells in your heart that do the rhythm of the beating. Oh, really? They're like directly on the organ that they make beat. That's crazy. But with breath, the other great pacemaker, it's located far from the organ that it controls. It's located in the brain. And once you put the, once you put breath into the brain, you allow evolution to put more on the breath than just a mechanical function. Like mm. it starts getting integrated into like the emotional centers of the brain and the anxiety oh. centers of the brain. And those parts of the brain can impact and regulate breath. Uh, a sigh, and then there's you know a laugh, you know, or a cry, or even speech. You know, all of those, those are actually breathing. So, yes, Matt, to Mm. answer your question, Mm -hmm. you see something scary, a signal gets sent um, from the fight or flight to the breath pacemaker saying, pick up the pace, you know. Uh But what Mark's research shows is that it's going both ways. Mm. There's crosstalk. There's deep integration happening. And the other key aspect of the breathing pacemaker compared to the cardiac pacemaker is you can consciously control the breathing pacemaker. That's the interesting. You can yeah. hold your breath, at least for a certain period of time, and you can change the output of the breathing paper. So you can override and alter the breathing pacemaker. Is, is that why, like, if I take, like, a... Like a deep breath, I can actually calm myself down? Yeah, that, that, that is the way that you're getting control of this communication between the breathing pacemaker and the fight or flight neuron. And so in talking to Mark, I feel like in a way he almost gave me like a scalpel to get inside my own brain and control it. Uh. Like if I actually change my breathing, it will change this breath pacemaker region and it will send an I'm chill signal to the fight or flight Mm -hmm. directly and it Hmm. will calm down wow it's like you cross a blood brain barrier and you're like on the ground floor communicating (laughs) communicating with Mm. the parts yeah it just i was it just felt like and so like last night like when i couldn't when i kept waking up like when i was sleeping i was like okay i'm just gonna breathe slowly and then I'm just like almost like being like, hi, neurons. <laughs> like I'm I'm breathing slowly now. So you can send the signal to the fight or flight that like I'm OK. And like I can like conduct this whole system.
Like, I can work the system. This next story is about when the system tries to conduct you. I saw it on Facebook. It was a Facebook post with uh, Mike Brown's body laying on the ground with his arms sticking out and his legs sticking out. And you see Darren Wilson, who's the police officer, sort of standing over him, looking down on him. So once I heard about what happened to Mike Brown... I was out there. This is Justin Hansford. He's a law professor at Howard University. And back in 2014, he was living just outside Ferguson. I was uh, mostly curious at first. During the day, it was just a march. People chanting and singing and clapping their hands. But also, there are people who are very upset. They're yelling, they're screaming, they're crying. By the time it starts to get dark, police start telling people which way to walk, giving people orders, tell you to go home. They actually have tanks on the streets, helicopters in the sky. Pretty soon after that, pop, 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 pop. Then you start seeing the gas. People's screaming in pain trying to rub their eyes. I just broke and bolted. But after that first night, Justin returned to the protests again and again. Yeah, I would go every day, especially during that first, what, 10, 14 day period. And whenever those canisters began to fly, whenever the tear gas came, he always did the same thing. I ran. I ended up talking to Justin because this past summer, seven years after his experience in Ferguson, at the height of the George Floyd demonstrations, even if you weren't on the streets at night, every morning you were seeing pictures and videos of these massive clouds of smoke hanging over people. It really began to feel like every time there was a demonstration or protest or march, it would end with tear gas. And I couldn't stop wondering, like, how did we get here? How did we get to this place where the go-to weapon for police responding to these protests is this gas? Hello? Hello. And the first thing that popped up was that it basically began in World War I. Right. First World War... You had trenches. I learned about all this from Anna Feigenbaum. I am an associate professor of digital media and communication at Bournemouth University. And she says those trenches... They were like a protection and a trap, right? People would just hide in their trenches and then shoot at each other and then hide in their trenches. It was really difficult to advance on either side. You couldn't move up on the enemy soldiers without getting shot. So both sides would just end up sitting there. So the question became... How do we get the enemy soldiers out of their trenches? And the answer? Tear gas. Tear gas. France were the first to fire it, according to the most agreed historical story of World War I. August 1914, the French fired tear gas grenades at the German line. Strange smoke crept across no man's land and down into the trenches. And given what tear gas does, we can imagine that the German soldiers started to rub their eyes in pain. Tears started streaming down their faces. And then, as they breathed the smoke in, they began to cough. They coughed and coughed. Their throats started to burn. Their chests tightened up. And at that point, 
panic set in. They left the safety of their trenches and began to run. And of course, then... You can shoot them. The French opened fire. And this moment sort of broke the seal for chemical warfare. Soon after, Germany brought chlorine gas and mustard gas, these far more harmful gases, to the battlefield. Other countries made and deployed their own gases. And eventually, gas just became this terror of World War I. Right. So First World War ended. What happened? So you've got people who are like, all gas warfare is inhumane. It creates a kind of psychological trauma and torture of the psyche that is just not acceptable. In the Treaty of Versailles in 1919, you may have heard of it. Um, I know all about it. This is like at the end of World War I. The Allies came together to figure out what to do about Germany. But at the same time, part of it was like, what do we do about gas? Uh huh. A- and it basically kicked off this whole debate, which would eventually get all these gases, including tear gas, banned from use in war. Mm. But one of the key things they did at the Treaty of Versailles was to make a distinction between the different gases. So there was... A really bad kind. Like chlorine gas. Yeah. Which could just straight up kill people. The not so bad kind. Like tear gas, which eventually got labeled non-lethal. Right. And Anna says... That distinction is really, really important. Because it left the door open for people to argue that even if we can't use tear gas in the trenches abroad, maybe we could use it on the streets back home. Okay, so fast forward to the end of the First World War. There's a recession. There's been a recent influx of Black folks in northern cities looking for opportunities that they don't have down south. And a lot of white soldiers just getting back from overseas see these Black folks as threats to their jobs. And in dozens of different cities across the states, gangs of white men roam the streets, burning Black homes and businesses and killing hundreds of Black people. And Black soldiers, who'd also recently returned home from war, were fighting back. This became known as the Red Summer of 1919. And in the midst of all of this, there was also a wave of labor strikes. And some police forces began writing to the War Department, requesting tear gas. This is from the New York Police Department in August 1919. It has occurred to me these gases might be an efficient agency in suppressing disorder. From the Department of Public Safety in Norfolk, Virginia, in September. In this city where it's possible that we may have a great deal of trouble with the Negro element, such a device, I believe, would work to perfection. And the War Department is like, no way. But these requests that said, send us tear gas, they kept coming. And in the meantime, there were people within the War Department who were thinking, Maybe this isn't such a bad idea. In particular, there was a general named Amos Fries, who was a huge proponent of tear gas. And he and his network started to arrange these big demos with these police departments. So he had like 200 police officers go out into a big field. You know, a bunch of police pretended to be the protesters and the other police were the police. The pretend protester police got shot with tear gas and Amos Fries made sure there were some reporters there to see it. In the article, there's these lines of like, the grown men were crying like babies. Showing that just by restricting their breath, he could dominate these guys, make them run or cower or give up. But the key part of his argument, the thing that made tear gas so special, was that a couple hours later, everyone's going to be back to normal and fine, and you won't have any you know, blood on your record. And as the riots and labor strikes and civil unrest continued, tear gas, this thing that could control a crowd without killing, started to win the day. And if you search the archives of the New York Times around 1921, 1922, tear gas holds back mob. Idle Reds threatened a tear gas revolt. Tear gas stops riot. You start to see tear gas slowly seep into its pages. Police use tear gas to dislodge maniacs. At first, it's only a few a year. Tear bombs used on Princeton students, police say. Tear bombs scatter Detroit mob of 5,000, which masses before anti-Klan meetings. But by the time you get into the 30s... Bombs rout crowd at Negro's Tear tribe. gas ends riot... There are hundreds of instances of tear gas being used all over the country. Tear gas ends riot against tear gas. Tear gas. Wilmington And tear so it got to the point where wherever there was a crowd of unhappy people, there was tear gas... The civil rights movement, the the anti-Vietnam War protests, the anti-globalization summits had lots of tear gas, Occupy got super tear gas. 
And I talked to this guy at the Omega Research Foundation. His name is Neil Corney. And part of his job is looking into the use of tear gas worldwide. Mm. And he told me that in the last 10 years or so, the use of tear gas has just exploded. And that is also, of course, when the Black Lives Matter movement really, you know, began and picked up steam. And over that time, Justin Hansford kept showing up at protests. He became a legal observer and even went on to accompany Mike Brown's family to Geneva to testify at the UN. And he says that he probably ran from tear gas about 30 times. I, there, were, there were times I could not escape it multiple times. Really, the worst time for me, I was actually in my car. Oh, wow. <clears throat> I have asthma. And, it, and, you know, a lot of, especially Black kids, have asthma, in part because where we've had to grow up. Uh, but anyway, I know that if I got tear gas in a major way, it could be lights out. So I ran to my car, and I couldn't drive through the protesters because the protesters were on the street. So I had to drive sort of perpendicular mm -hmm. to get around where the protest was. Unfortunately, everybody else was trying to do the same thing. So I was about one block over from where they had deployed the tear gas. And I was stuck. I double-checked to make sure my windows were I tried to roll them up more, tried to turn off my vents. I knew when the tear gas had entered the car because I could recognize the smell. Almost like laundry detergent, but it's more pungent. <clears throat> I was panicking a bit because I didn't have my inhaler on me at the time. Dang. Like I covered my mouth, but I knew that I knew there wasn't much I could do. I was coughing a lot. I was coughing uncontrollably. Tears were coming down. I never knew if it would just hit. Like I'd have an asthma attack and just hit. Just panic. As his chest clenched and tightened, as he struggled to breathe. You're in flight mode. Like you're frantically searching for what's going to keep you alive and you're not finding it. It's sort of impossible, hearing this story, to not think about that phrase, I can't breathe that's become a rallying cry for the whole movement. It's sort of sitting over all of this as both a metaphor and literal experience. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's seared into our minds because the phrase was repeated. It gets repeated in the people's final uh, moments of their life. Eric Garner and George Floyd, those are their last words, and that the chokehold and that position of putting someone prone on the ground with your knee on their back, even if, even if it interferes with their breath. So the panic in that moment is in his body, but also in the world he lives in and his history. You know, we have a history of lynching in this country, People hanging from trees, couldn't breathe. It was often a type of suffocation that happened in our history. It's a, it's a legacy of that. Always a choking. And all of that settles on Justin in that moment in the car. I sort of just put my head down and uh, I sort of just steal myself to take whatever's going to take place. He says it was in some way a feeling of resignation. I, I, was re I was resigned. I have to be honest with you. But also resolve. Imagine me driving with my hands on the steering wheel. I smell it and I just start hanging. I just hang my head and just like shake my head and just say, all right, now here we go. So, you know. I wish there was like a lighter question I can now ask you. <laughs> yeah, it's something light. What do you do to, uh, what do you do to feel better? What do you do to unplug and relax? Or do you not like? Or do you just feel, you just write papers? Or do you have like, <laughs> do you have a cat? Like, what do you do? <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> oh, you know what I like? To do? I like to go jogging. 
And especially if it's warm outside and there's sun and I listen to some <laughs> music. I like to jog when it's very sunny out. I just like to get out, out there early in the morning, listen to the birds sing for a little while, and then just turn up to Janet Jackson and just make it happen. In keeping with something lighter. Matt, do you know what you're talking about? Do you have any idea what you're talking about? <laughs> Did it turn out that no, he didn't? Yeah. Wait, who are you? I have no idea who you are. <laughs> maybe me? Yeah, yeah. Maybe we should. Yeah. Maybe we should back up. If you could, if you could just like say who you are. Okay. So like, when do you want me to start doing this? Like now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Five, four. You guys are nuts. Um. Okay. So I'm Marcia Mogolanski. I'm the director of Insight at Mintel Food and Drink. Director of Insight. Insight, yes. What is a director of Insight? A person who sits on the phone with people like you and talks about where mints came from. Which is uh, sort of true because Marcia works for this uh, market research analytics company, um, and she's in the food department. I am the category expert for confectionery. So I'm in charge wow. of chocolate, gum, and mints. <laughs> yes, this is like the perfect job. <laughs> well, like when you started, um, what jumped out to you about mints? What was interesting to me is the, the, the line between a mint, a candy, and a breath freshener is very fuzzy unless you're going for breath freshening <laughs> strips or what we used to, you know, squirt into our mouths. I don't know if they even exist anymore. Oh, my God. Like Banaka. Oh, Banaka. Banaka. God, Banaka was great. And then, the, then there were those um, Listerine <sighs> breath strips. freshening strips oh, that dissolved on your tongue. Those are really Awful. weird. Yeah. They were really weird and they were gross tasting. That's now market, you s- that feels like it's a market innovation, though. I mean, it was when it was first launched, but um, it doesn't really exist anymore. It's been replaced by other innovations. Like what's What are the new ones? It was Mint, the hot well, thing right now. Just minty flavored, strong minty flavored everything. Like those Altoids that come in strong minty flavors. Mm -hmm. But this is a really small slice, really small slice of the confectionery industry. This is not, you know, stop traffic. We've got a new mint. Mm -hmm. Because it is intended for two purposes, basically. Well, maybe three. Number one is breath freshening. Number two is to wake yourself up because you're having a slump and you're really bored. So you reach for something little at your desk. You're not going to eat a bag of Doritos when you're having a slump. (laughs) Speak for yourself. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. But most people are looking for a pick-me-up. And that pick-me-up could be Mm -hmm. a a chocolate. It could be a cookie. It could be just a mint because you don't want to have anything too big. You just want something different. You want something to chew on. And the mint is like kind of stimulating Stimulate, Or you want something to chew on, which is to... um, Get rid of nervous tension or stop yourself from doing something worse like eating or smoking. Right. Mm. And number four is kissing. (laughs) Well, yes, of course. (laughs) Um, Okay. Well, uh, so so last time we spoke, um, you had said something that that totally surprised me because I just called you up being like, I don't know, breath, breath mints, what, like what's going on? And you said that the market is down. Yeah. The market for mints and gum sales have declined. Why have sales declined? It's not because we all want to have stinky breath. Well, that might be part of it. But the major reason is those are really impulse purchases. On the way to work, getting on the train. Before you get on the train, there's a kiosk right by the subway stop. You go, oh, I could use some mints. My breath's feeling a little stinky. So you pick up a package of mints and you throw them in your purse or your pocket or whatever. Um, That doesn't happen anymore because no one's going anywhere. Because you see them and you realize there is a need. Right. And the need is you have to freshen your breath. You fr- have to freshen your breath because you're going to go have some very garlicky food for supper and then you're going on a date afterwards. Or you're going to work and you have a big meeting and you're going to have to meet the boss. Mm-hmm. But you happen to have had garlic chicken for lunch, which was a big mistake, believe me. Garlic um, everywhere. <laughs> or you're at the bar and you have a drink and then you meet someone and you want to talk to them and you don't want to appear like you've been drinking. 
You want to have fresher oh, breath. Oh, yeah. At the bar, I wasn't drinking, I swear. <laughs> you're eating <laughs> you my can't garlic Can't you tell chicken. by my spearmint breath? I haven't been drinking at all. <laughs> exactly. Um, you don't normally have them, but suddenly you have a reason to buy them. Um, yes. It's not a planned purchase. It's usually an impromptu purchase. There's also something like the idea of like breath mints or something hopeful about that. Like you reach for it because you have a date later or because you have a meeting later or there's like you're going to be a person in the world and this is going to help you. And it's going to be like your assist or your lifesaver or like, yeah, you know, yeah. whatever. And and so like and this like lack of reaching for these like little hopeful things that will like, you know, push us to be that much better in our day or that much more confident. It's like just interesting that we're in yeah. that time. And I think that right things now. will improve. I think that this has just been a yeah. blip in the general universe of things. Mm-hmm. This has been a, a wholesale change in people's behaviors that people just did not anticipate. No one yeah. ever thought we would grind to a halt where right. we spent the past year staring at our own four walls and not meeting people and going to the movies, going to concerts, going shopping, going socializing, All that stuff just ground to a halt. Right. But I think that things will improve. I think that people are going to be desperate to resume. Going to be popping mints like crazy. Oh, yeah. And sneezing their way (laughs) from here to there. So, um, (laughs) you guys seriously don't sneeze when you eat a strong mint? No. No, I do like the idea, though, of like um, the sign that we're getting out of the darkness is the breath mint rebounding. Yeah. Yeah. I ended up calling another uh, retail sales firm. They told me that. In the pandemic, mint sales dropped by 40%, but that since March, with each passing day, they started to see mint sales tick back up. Okay, uh, I'm going to count down from 10. I will stop the countdown at 3. Everybody ready? Here we go. Ten, nine, eight, <coughs> seven, six, five, four, three. We're going to keep breathing. Just after this man holds this note for as long as he can. Be right back. This is Angela Babiars from San Jose, California. Radiolab is supported in part by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, enhancing public understanding of science and technology in the modern world. More information about Sloan at www.sloan.org. Science reporting on Radiolab is supported in part by Science Sandbox, a Simons Foundation initiative dedicated to engaging everyone with the process of science. Annie, Matt, Radio Lab. Okay, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. I sense a disturbance in the air. My chest feels tighter. Something is not quite right. And then I see it. Flames are licking the bottoms of trees. Hundreds of miles away. From my home in San Francisco, I just sense a wildfire coming before most people because of how my respiratory system is built. My diaphragm, which is slowly weakening over time, gives me a heightened sensitivity to secrets in the air. Because my diaphragm is weak, I use a ventilator to help me push the air out of my lungs. Without this machine, my own CO2 would gather my body, then I would die slowly from a buildup of acidic blood. This nearly happened when I was 18. 
their first experience of respiratory failure. My brain went fuzzy. Dead in the ER. I remember seeing my arterial blood drawn from my body, starved of oxygen. Thick and black as it. But I clawed my way back. They live to tell the tale. And that is, if you are willing to listen. When the coronavirus broke out, many states raised people like me who need a machine to breathe to lower down on the list to those deserving medical treatment. New York went even further. According to the ventilator allocation guidelines on the New York State Department of Health's website, it says the hospitals are allowed to take people's personal ventilators and give them to other patients in times of triage if they seek acute care. In essence, they can steal breaths from people like me and give them to others. But my body, that the state calls broken, I call an oracle. It's not just the distant flames that I can see before you, but it's the cold bath that calculates the value of my life, an algorithm of respectability, that whether you realize it or not, it can come for you as well. My name is Alice Wong, and I'm a disabled activist, writer, and all-around troublemaker. Okay, so this next thing comes from... Yeah, you sound great. All right. Writer Mosey Secret, who typically does some pretty serious journalism. Yeah, I mean, I, I have mostly done investigative reporting or or in-depth narrative writing on issues of race or issues of criminal justice. And man, this just sounds like, you know, like, you know, fun. <laughs> yeah, imagine that. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. But I will say that this did not end up being a totally silly thing. So, thing begins. Maybe th- two or three years ago, there was this video that went around... Funk Flex, I'm here. From Funk Master Flex's I mean, show. On Hot 97. Hashtag freestyle. And just to set up the significance of what you're about to hear. So Flex, he's got a radio show. A lot of rappers come on. And it's a regular feature that Funk Master Flex has where people kind of come on and freestyle. Young and May here. About to shut it down on the Funk Flex show. And there are a lot of people who are... Yeah, hey, man. Eight Boogie with the hoodie. I'm with my man, Don Q. A lot of younger, newer rappers who come on and, you know, who are doing something. They think they're doing something. Dawn season. We the curse. about to go crazy. Think they're doing something. Because in these freestyles... Yeah. Uh-huh. Which are very, very good. There are moments of uh, nah, 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 nah. Uh-huh. rappers who are kind of stalling out. Hold on. Hold on. Rappers who want to do multiple takes. Rappers who can only go for like a minute or two. And so they're like, okay, let's bring in the OG and show them how it's done. I mean, look, I like to answer people's demands. I like to come through with what they ask me for. So this video is a video of Black Thought is here. The rapper Black Thought. And we're gonna, you know what we do in this position. He's sitting at a desk next to Flex. He's got on a beige fedora, sunglasses. Let's go, Earns. And do it. He just kind of like destroys it. Uh, I'm sorry for your loss. There's somebody dead in the car and it's probably one of yours. The writing all across the window in the walls. Whether it was true or false, we shouldn't have got involved. Remember, we walked past the teacher, take the chalk and laugh. We wrote punishments. I will not talk in class. Now it's pistols punishing people for talking fast. And all these innocent bystanders is hauling ass. I and what I told unfolds in this freestyle is 
10 minutes of him not missing a beat. Fools swear they wise, wise men know they foolish. But we was headed for the web even before computers. And the beat was very fast, and the rhymes were like intricate. I was making major moves, my dollar deja vu. My mission when my ambition was brandishing a tool to be an icon. When slippers made a python. My- and what you start to see in this video is as Black Thought keeps going, it's like about three minutes in. You can kind of see this motion in his body, like he starts to almost like bounce in his seat. At about five minutes, he breaks a sweat. We went from Similac and Infamil to the internet and fentanyl. What all consent was still against the will. I got the detox for y'all. The microphone, Dr. Black, Deepak Chappelle. By six minutes, the sweat is just dripping down his face. By seven minutes, you're just like, this guy's entering a trance. I'm just regular. I'm an apex predator. Brim, stay fresh, feathered up, et cetera, but never the By eight minutes, you can see Flex's face just like, oh shit. By nine minutes, you can tell he's just like pushing it out. I'm a bull inside a china shop. Molly whopping, watch another cotton pick and body drop every time we rock. Yo, and finally, like just under 10 minutes, 10 minutes straight, Black Thought lands this freestyle. Ain't too much data. I tell a story like fingerprints and blood splatter. You see what it is? Black Thought Funk Flex, one motherfucking take. You just saw what it's supposed to be. Ciroc Studios. You mad? Fuck yourself. Stop the bombs. <laughs> and after that, there are all these discussions like, oh, you know, like, is he one of the greatest rappers of all time? Do we not know this? And I was talking to some friends about it. Like, a lot of people were talking about it. And, um, like, one of my friends was like, well, you know he can do that because uh, he can circular breathe. And I was like, huh, that sounds crazy that he can circular breathe (laughs) while rapping. Um, And I was just like, oh, okay, that explains it. Um, That explains it. Because for Mosi, he knew the power of circular breathing. As a kid, Mosi got really into jazz when he picked up a saxophone. And I was, you know, in the beginning, I was really into horn players. You know, John Coltrane and Sonny Rollins, these tenor saxophone players. These guys became heroes because that's what I was trying to learn. And so as a kid, he had heard about circular breathing. I almost had this mythic quality, like this kind of superhuman uncanny ability that some people have to sustain sound for minutes and minutes or hours and hours. Like Sonny Rollins, I knew that he could do it, kind of do these solo improvisations, and they were incredible. And Mosey always thought, like, if you could just learn how to get there, learn this technique you could enter this other realm. But I was not the best practicer. (laughs) And I also just had this feeling that people were listening to me and I felt, you know, a little embarrassed that I wasn't good yet. So (laughs) eventually he put down the sax. So I hadn't thought about saxophone or circular breathing for a long time. But then... Funk Flex, I'm here. Huh, that sounds crazy. And so, talking about this this episode that you guys are doing, mostly pitches a story about the freestyle, about circular breathing. We were just like, yeah. So I, I think he went off reporting, basically internet research. Ended up on Reddit. On this, like I read this subreddit where it's like, oh my god, did you guys see that flow? You know why he can do that? It's because he can circular breathe. And then people are like, oh man, that's so amazing. <laughs> that's why he's so great. And then there, you know, like a few posts down, there's somebody who comes in. He's like, well. Actually, I play clarinet, and it is technically Im- impossible. It is actually impossible for one to <laughs> use circular breathing while speaking. Huh. Hmm. Yeah. And I'll just say really quick, in hindsight, went back and watched the Black Thought video. Probably one of yours. The writing all across it was the just like, oh. <laughs> He's breathing all the time. <laughs> This is just a super cut. This is a super cut him breathing. <laughs> and it, I didn't count the breaths, but it's like a lot of, <laughs> clearly a lot of breaths. Um, like, sort of, he's just like breathing like a normal person, but doing this extraordinary thing. Yes. The artistry there is amazing. So, like, he's a genius, but he's not doing the crazy, godly, mythic thing of circular breathing. But, um, but then Mosey dropped another bomb. From what I understand, like, most horn players can do it. 
<laughs> I know. Sorry. Oh, um, no, no, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are videos on on YouTube showing you how to do it. So, like oh, in Kenny G's how to video on YouTube, he says, oh, wait, wait, "No, this." I'm sorry. Excuse me. You have to watch the <laughs> Kenny G tutorial. Hello, it's Kenny G here. Welcome to the Rico website. Because <laughs> just everything about it says, you know, 1990s smooth jazz <laughs> yep. Kenny G. Yes. And it's called circular breathing. It's where you hold a note and you actually breathe while you're still sustaining the sound. But anyway, this is what happens when you do it right, okay? <laughs> And then there's stuff, you know, like... So, what is circular breathing? You can circular breathe in 10 minutes. Oh. <laughs> that seems inhuman. If you practice it, it comes really, really quickly. So, you can see how I'm breathing through that. I'm not out of air. Now. So, it is... There is, like, a little bit of, like, oh, I could have been doing this when I was 12. You know, like, damn, this is a lot easier than I thought it was. But, is it really? More people. Oh, hello. Hello. How's it going? So, Annie and I went out... Into the world. Um, we're at the Brooklyn Music School in downtown Brooklyn. To a room at the Brooklyn Music School, which had a little vibraphone, piano, and also some flautists. It's called a headpiece. There were three of them. Your name is? My name is Adelaide. I'm Matt. Nice to meet you. There was Addie. My name is Sadie Lou. Sadie Lou. And I like watermelon. <laughs> so Addie, Sadie Lou, both 10 years old. Oh, and Hannah, Hannah how old are you? 12. And Hannah, the 12-year-old. And which grade is that? Seventh. Also, there was Shia, the flute instructor, and a couple parents. Um, did your parents explain to you what's uh, what we're trying to do? Do you know about circular breathing? No. Uh, uh, I think it's like breathing, like a um, breathing technique where you're breathing um, with your nose and your mouth at the same time. Exactly. Yeah, well, I can actually kind of tell you how to do it. Okay. <laughs> So Mosey tried to teach us how to do it. We tried to teach the kids. Okay, maybe maybe we should take a second. Practice step one. So if you just blow up your cheeks. Put some air in your mouth cheeks. And then breathe through your nose while you have that air in your cheeks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we got some fast learners. Okay. <laughs> Does everybody feel good about step one? Yes. The second thing that you'll do mm -hmm. is while you have okay. your cheeks blown up, mm -hmm. use your fingers mm. to... Press in your cheeks. Squeezing the air out of your cheeks. Out of your taut lips. Mm. <laughs> Very elegant little... Slowly, I should say. <laughs> and so the skill is learning to force that air out of your mouth with your cheek muscles. Wow. Rather than with your fingers. Oh. And you are doing that at the same time as you are inhaling. Okay. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, how do we feel about step two? Okay, great. And then the last part is, which is where it gets really difficult. How do you refill the cheeks? Exactly. How do you refill the cheeks? So one of the things that we need for this is a straw. So there's three straws. And this is the really tricky part is you have to, while you're pushing the air out with your cheek muscles, you have to inhale to get some more air back in there. And you just keep it going, continuous flow. Also, I will hand out. I will hand out jars of water. So no, you get a you get a glass. You fill it half with water. You fill your cheeks with air. Blow through the straw into the water. And the way that you know that you're doing it correctly is that the water obviously will bubble, and you want those bubbles right. to continue forever. Yeah, forever. Okay, I'll start at three, three, two, one, breathe. And what we saw was our two 10-year-olds, God love them, after about 20 seconds when their faces were just like pure pushing out air. Oh my God. They took a breath. But then we noticed... Are you, are you already doing it? Our 12-year-old, Hannah, Go. was totally doing it. Hannah, how? What? I think you got it. Oh my oh, god. Shia's, yeah, Shia's got big Shia. bubbles over here. Shia, the flute instructor, picked it up. Look at your mom's a champion. <laughs> Eddie's mom got it. Stop. Doesn't stop. She wants to stop. <laughs> Good job. Mom, that was great. That was awesome. Woo! Nice job. So, yeah, circular breathing. Uh, easy peasy, fun for the whole family. Although, I, I will say that actually doing it on the flute proved really hard. Um, 
And to be fair... It only took about 20 years to kind of get it okay. Kenny G said, took him a long time to master it. But yeah, it turns out it's pretty simple. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just I'm just wondering, given that and the sort of letdown of uh, Black Thought and horn players and whatnot, like, w- was there anything in your reporting that um, sort of jumped out to you? Well, I think that... Um, I mean, a lot of it has to do with the idea of the breath. So, like in hmm. in Western music, especially, or the Western theory, kind of revolves around the phrase, the musical phrase, and the phrase is something that really is modeled on the human voice and on breath. So, oh, there is something that begins and there is something that ends, hmm. and one's breath and one's phrasing is highly personal, and, and it is like. It is the signature. It is the way you breathe, the way you speak is what makes um, your music musically yours. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I haven't really ever considered the way in which my breath is intrinsically tied to my speech and the way that that's like distinct in some way. Yeah, yeah. It, it made me think about um, the way in which it defines me or the way in which it is kind of a signature of mine, the way that I have a rhythm there's a there's a rhythm to the way that I speak, which is entirely my own, and there's a rhythm to the way that you speak that is entirely your own, um, and that and that I, it might even be possible to recognize that rhythm absent the words that I'm utter, that I'm uttering. Mm-hmm. You know that, that there's something there's that there's a sound that we produce with our breath that is so kind of innately ours um, that. Uh, yeah, it's it's almost like a fingerprint, right? Huh. Right, and then it becomes this really interesting tension of then how do you escape that, or how can you? And so circular breathing then becomes this way of okay, if this is my limitation, who am I or what am I if I don't have that limitation and if I can kind of sustain my breath indefinitely. So this is the piece, Moto Perpetuo. Which was this violin solo, known to be kind of one of the hardest passages in classical music. And in the 1960s, Rafael Mendez came across it. And played it for trumpet. This version is a version by Wynton Marcellus. And it's like four minutes of just unbroken, very high tempo sound. That's two minutes.
Schmidt. And it just keeps going on and 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 another and on and on and on indefinitely. Yes. It's Robert again. Robert Krovich. Former co-host. I know. I, I didn't die. I'm just lying here. <laughs> Nothing to do this afternoon. <laughs> I have a thought. Let's talk about breath. <laughs> so we told Robert what we were up to with this breath show. And he came back to us with a tale of a time when the air was so different that the creatures who breathed it were literally transformed. Okay, so we're talking about 350 million years ago or so. Yeah, the world at that time was wet and warm and very swampy. And covered in forests filled with very weird-looking trees. Skinny but very tall, like pencils, with a little, like a chicken on top or something, like a little (laughs) little feather head sort of top. And of course, what a tree does is it takes in CO2 and pumps out oxygen. So there's oxygen flowing into the sky in great amounts because there's so many trees. Today, our atmosphere is 21% oxygen. But back then... The amount of oxygen in the air is something like 31 or 32% or something like that. That's an oxygen-rich... That would be like going into one of those, you know, into a greenhouse where you feel that very pleasant sensation of Mm -hmm. just very clear, I don't know, heady air that you can feel in a greenhouse. That's the whole world was like that at the time. Oh, is that why a greenhouse feels like that? Yeah, yeah. You're getting a little Ah. oxygen high when you go into a greenhouse. It's a little bit like maybe wearing a terry cloth robe in a really nice Four Seasons hotel. Lung wise, you get gorgeous (laughs) air, (laughs) luxury air. You just probably just feel you finally feel pampered. I guess is Ah. what I imagine. It's sort of nice to, like, imagine squishing through that moist, warm forest, feeling like you're wearing a terry cloth robe at a hotel. (laughs) But now you might not want to do that because of what all this oxygen has done to the bugs. Oh, yeah. You see something very startling going on. And real quick, to understand this startling thing, you have to know that both back then and today, Bugs don't have lungs. No, they don't. Instead, they have these little holes all over them, like a polka dot kind of outside. And they get the air, and thus the oxygen, into their bodies through these holes. So breathing for a bug is... The equivalent of opening a window. You just open your (laughs) valve and you wait. Air drifts into the holes and the oxygen in the air feeds the insect cells. Now, because the oxygen is just sort of drifting rather than traveling through veins, the cells closer to the surface closer to the window, get more oxygen. And so, if there's not that much oxygen in the air, you have to make sure all your cells are really close to the surface, meaning you have to be little. But when oxygen levels were 30-something percent... The chances of a hungry cell in your body getting a meal has just gone up. And if more cells can feed, then you can grow bigger. And bigger, and bigger, and bigger... 
there's a spider from that period who is, you know, and spiders are very leggy animals. But how about a leg that's a foot and a half? You just like pat them on the head as you pass them by. <laughs> there's a dragonfly that had a wingspan that's about two feet across. Oh, dear two God. Feet. Just think about that for a moment. <laughs> that's like a seagull in the form of a, of a dragonfly. <laughs> So that would be so weird. Wow. They have a millipede. There was one that was eight and a half feet long. Oh, my God. Actually, it might have been more like seven feet long, but still. It would be like a gigantic (gasps) crocodile in the form of a millipede. You could just lie on one and read a book as it, like, slithered along. Yes, it could be a bus you take (laughs) to the next side of the forest. Just lie on its back. (laughs) Yeah. Hmm. I guess, like, if you're a bug what's in the air like totally defines you Mm. or like sets your physical boundaries right because like because there's so much oxygen in the air um oh that's rick burns hey uh, i'm I'm doing an interview but can i call you back later (laughs) okay some Um. things never change That's true. I have never figured out how... I never remembered to turn off the phone when we go do these things. <laughs> so, four years ago is actually when we first thought about doing this episode. And and the reason, the impetus for that was actually because of this small piece of tape that we heard. The sound of a breath. I know. Do you do anything else? Right. Do you have like so a hobby? Yeah. And that breath... And that tape came to us from uh, New York Times audio producer, Annie Brown. Yeah. Um, this came about because I was applying for a job at the New York Times. This is 2017. And I got an assignment that I had to find a story that was about controlling an urge or an impulse um, that was surprising and gave you some kind of instructions on how to do it. And I really wanted to get this job. And I found these two people who figured out that controlling the urge to breathe was largely psychological. That actually it's like really not a physical thing. So. Okay. The two people Annie found are these free divers who live in Canada. They're just like the most famous trainers of breath holding. And Annie flew out to Canada, spent a day training with them in their house and then went to her hotel pool. The Comfort Inn on Vancouver Island. So, um... With her instructor, Kirk. Just kind of goes through a little bit of a briefing. So, really just to kind of get us comfortable. And so Annie's standing next to the pool. I got on a hooded wetsuit. The place reeks of chlorine. And, like, the air is so thick, you know? It's just that kind of, like, it's so familiar to me. Are you a swimmer? Yeah. Okay. Like, that's that's how it feels on the pool deck. That's how it felt at that meet. I went, you know, it's just like, that is a very familiar feeling. Okay, so um, let's find that depth. So she gets in the pool. I wouldn't say standing, we want it out. Collarbone. Uh, be about like that, right? Like a good depth. Comf- yeah, okay. So I'm on the side of the pool. Um, I am just trying to relax. And so I'm like... <sighs> doing my like slow breaths to calm my heart right down. Nice and relaxed. Now, most people can hold their breath for about a minute or two, but beyond that, what happens is carbon dioxide starts to build up in your body and your brain starts to panic. It'll try and get you to inhale and exhale before it shuts down. Annie was trying to hold her breath for over three minutes. In 10 seconds. And then it's like, okay, time to take a big breath in. And five, four, three, two, one. Like drop my hands from the side of the pool and just let myself fall into the water. So I'm face down in the pool, like arms, arms floating by my side, just floating there, like a piece of jello. You're just jiggling in the water. I was like, this is amazing. And like, I felt good through like a minute and a half where it was like, like tap for like one minute, give me a signal. And I was like, still feeling pretty good. And I move my finger and I show him that I'm, that I'm okay. And then... (laughs) 
I get my first contraction. Your body starts to demand to breathe by contracting the diaphragm. So you start getting these convulsions in your belly that feel like hiccups. It's like, it's like, and it's like, okay. Okay, um, uh, keep relaxing. Stage by stage, like your shins, relax them. Your knees, relax them. Your thighs, relax them. And then... They're coming more and more frequently. But also there's this, this voice, like, you didn't get a good breath in. You're not going to make it. You're the worst at this. And so just like go back to the toes and the ankles and the shins and the knees and the stomach and the arms and the shoulders and the mouth. Two minutes. And then Kirk. I want you to go on a vacation talks me through packing for this vacation. You're going to go to Europe. You're going to grab your luggage and you're going to pack everything you need to go to Paris. Paris for two weeks. And I was really doing it where I was like, okay, my luggage is under the bed. I'm going to pull it out. I'm going to unzip it. Slow and relax. It's like, okay, what do I, I don't know what I'm going to bring. I'm definitely going to bring that coat, though. So I was like, okay, I started getting my coat. And I was really trying to pack this coat. Okay, okay, get my luggage. Pull it out, unzipping it. I don't know what shirt to pack. Okay, I can't do this packing thing anymore. And then it was just like, you're just fighting. You're just holding on. Gonna make it. You're the worst at this. You are a fucking idiot. You are so dumb. Why did you do this? Like you're so bad at everything you've ever tried. And then I was like, oh Madeline. Like I saw her from above, her head in the water. And then I was like, oh my god. This this is this. It's this. So Annie grew up with two sisters. The oldest was Madeline. And she had epilepsy. And so starting at like age 10 or 12, she started having seizures sort of just randomly. You know, it would happen like um, at a when something really exciting was happening, like she'd be at like um, a school dance or like she'd be at the football game of the year. And eventually she started taking medication to control the seizures. But after you have seizures and like are like the, the kid who's like convulsing on the floor, like you just kind of can't get any less cool than that. So she was just like the most unabashedly herself person in the world. Like we, we all shared a a Toyota Camry in uh, high school. Oh, like that was the one car for the three girls yeah, to drive? Yeah, for the three girls to drive. But she got a vanity license plate that said Mad Dog. <laughs> wow. And then she, she got a SpongeBob <laughs> steering wheel cover. But the big thing that Madeline did, actually all the girls did, is swim. I was a bad swimmer. But Madeline was the swimmer. She loved to swim. And she was a butterflyer. Oh, cool. Yeah, she was super strong, like much stronger than me. And like just got super fast and was so committed to it. Eventually, she got recruited to swim in a college in Atlanta. She did that her freshman year. Yeah. And how did you find out what happened to her? I was at home getting ready for this snowball dance. Um, oh, because you're still in high school. Still in high school. I was a junior. And that was the night of the big dance. Annie was getting ready. And my parents just kind of yelled, like, we're going to the hospital. Madeline is sick. And, you know, she had had seizures so many times and been in the hospital so many times that I was just kind of like... Okay, like, you know, like, here we go. They left the house, drove to the hospital. And before we walked into the emergency room, they told my mom that she was in a coma. And my mom just, like, she just, like, collapsed. Madeline had been found in the college swimming pool, face down in the water. There wasn't a lifeguard on duty. So, uh, like, just like um, an adult swimmer who had come in to do, you know, his own laps— just like noticed her. And we don't really know what happened. She likely had a seizure and fell in the pool. Annie and her family basically moved into the hospital. And it was the morning, it was um, the morning of the fourth day. And I really didn't want it to end. I really didn't want to. I was like, let's just give it another day. But the doctor was like, this, she's not. She's not coming back. 
the rest of the day, I drove home with my dad. And I just kept on repeating to myself, like, my sister died today. Today, my sister died. And we got home. Everything looks different. Everything looked like it had been moved around. And I sat in the living room and I was just like, Madeline died today. And so there Annie was in this pool. This voice. You're not going to make it. You're the worst at this. Getting louder and louder. Fucking idiot. You're going to die. And it was after three minutes of having not taken a breath. I was like, oh, Madeline. And I suddenly like was her floating there. And then I was just like, I got to come up. (laughs) Breathe. 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 Coming out, I felt kind of like giddy. <laughs> right, right, good job. So, uh, 337. And like, it was like in the tape, there's no like acknowledgement of the like terror. <laughs> but it is, it's weird. It's like, I felt so like, yeah. Uh, coming like it's a very strange series of like of emotions after all this was over Annie said when she was thinking about Madeline coming to her in the water she kept coming back to this question what was the point of that like Mm. why did you do it and what did you learn um and while in some way it was just this thing she was doing to get a job this story about controlling an impulse or an urge she realized that in her reaction to Madeline's death, there was also an impulse, uh, a voice that would come to her in moments of pain and sorrow, not totally unlike the voice she heard in the pool. Like, why wasn't I the one who died? You know, like, and she was so good. Like, why wasn't it me? She should be alive, and I should have been the one who died. Annie says in the years since Madeline died, she's learned how to push that voice away. But she did say that moment in the pool gave her another way to push it and like uncovered a muscle she didn't totally know that she had. If you can like learn to not trust that voice, you know, and like really put it down, um, that it can get better. And hopefully it just means I can do it more, you know, that like when those things come up, recognizing them as this like unnecessary voice. And getting past that voice, Annie said, lets you push through the grief. Or maybe just like settle into it in a way that lets you heal. It feels like we can enjoy the memories of her more. Like you can like enjoy just who she was and where like it's like just a like a memory of her that can like that can be like a blanket that I can pull out and wrap around me and put back in the closet um so like I went to one of her swim meets in college um and and that was that was about a week before she died and she died in that pool um I went to see her, um, see her swim because she was trying to get these big qualifying times. And um, so I drove over to Emory because we lived in Atlanta. And it was, I think, like a Saturday morning. And I was watching her. You know, she's like super focused before she goes in the pool. And she like gets on the stand and dives in. And like she's good, just going so much. Her splits are so much faster than they've been in the past. And I think she's going to get these times. And she, and she got them, um, and she doesn't know that I'm there. And um, I, like, made my way down to the pool, which, like, you're really 
not supposed to go on the pool deck, you know, because it's like for swimmers only. And I'm <laughs> not a swimmer anymore. <laughs> now, <laughs> now I'm in the theater um, <laughs> where I belong. Um, and I, I made it down to the pool and just kind of like slipped by the people and was on the pool deck, like trying to find her. And she was in the warm down pool. So she's just swimming and I'm like trying to yell at her and she like doesn't see me. And she does her, you know, her flip turn and flip turn. And I finally just like kind of whack her as she does a flip turn. <laughs> And she looks up at me and she goes, ah. This episode was reported and produced by us, along with Molly Webster. With production help from Kareen Leong and Sara Kari. Reporting help from Sara Kari, Alex Neeson, Lulu Miller, Latif Nasser, Johnny Moens. This episode had sound design from Jeremy Bloom and voice work from David Gable and Alexander Ritchie. Okay, special thanks. Uh, special thanks to a lot of people. Kevin Burke, Ren Farrell, Antonia Sarahito, Cisco Grazia, Joe Arena, Praveen Juwarilal. Special thanks also to Rohini Har, Sven Eric Yort, Paul Dixon, Neil Corney, Mary Dalton, and Jack Feldman. Big thanks to everybody over at the Brooklyn Music School. Huge thanks to Latif and Carly and Fival for the use of their birth tape that you can hear at the end of the first story, as well as to Alan Zeely, Thaisa Mancheo, and Antonio for the use of their birth tape that you can hear at the end of the episode. And finally, um, a thanks to Richard Fink IV, who is, not the man you heard during the break, but is the current holder of the longest held sung note. I'm Annie McEwen. And I'm Matt Kilty. Thank you for listening. Radio Lab was created by Jed Abumrad and is edited by Soren Wheeler. Lulu Miller and Latif Nasser are our co-hosts. Susie Lechtenberg is our executive producer. Dylan Keefe is our director of sound design. Our staff includes Simon Adler, Jeremy Bloom, Becca Bressler, Rachel Kusick, David Gable, Maria Paz Gutierrez, Sindhu Nyanasambandam, Matt Kilty, Annie McEwen, Alex Neeson, Sara Kari, Ariane Wack, Pat Walters, and Molly Webster. With help from Shima Oliayi, Sarah Sandbach, Karine Leong, and Candice Wong. Our fact checkers are Diane Kelly and Emily Krieger. Thank you.